Okay, so today is uh, probably actually the most boring lecture uh, you will probably have. That said, at least there's images in it compared to last week's lecture. But I used to do this lecture in the last two weeks, these la last weeks and this week's lecture. I used to do in the last two weeks of the term, mostly because they're kind of dry, but there's not a lot of hard work that shakes out of them. And I liked giving uh, the graduate students to have kind of an easy ride in the last two weeks. Um, there was some requests about combining things with other courses and trying to give some, uh, some layout. Basically, when all the faculty met, we decided that I was the best person to introduce basic construction methods to you and to try to do it earlier in the term. So instead of being a lecture, being lecture 11 and 12, they are now lecture three and four. Uh, it does mean it shifts some of our hard stuff towards the end, but you won't have submittable assignments. You'll have work through assignments that you can do to test yourself, but no mark will be given for it. So they're just there for your enjoyment. This week has an actual assignment. Um, as you can imagine, it's not going to be that hard because this is kind of a really hard thing to test on. Uh, remember, you have a week to go through it. Um, uh, so let's get started on these lectures. Actually, before I do that, I'd like to point out that I am filming this on September 30th, which is um, Orange Shirt Day, which is in recognition of um, Indigenous people being taken uh, from their homes and placed in uh, residential schools. Uh, so I just like to say that I'm wearing this in recognition of that injustice. Okay, so let's start with what happens to be my favorite construction material uh, and also a really good one for basic introduction to almost all of the things we're going to learn. In fact, when we start to get into things next term, you're going to see that steel is the one that we use kind of really nicely to kind of help explain the thought process of a lot of the things we're going to look at. So again, this is going to be a lot of pictures. So let's look at some images of steel construction. So normally I'd like to draw things out, help explain it a little bit. We're going to have to do it graphically here. So we talked a lot about, or we talked about um, tributary area and tributary width and what direction things were spanning. Um, and we talked briefly about a hierarchy of beams. So this is um, probably concrete on metal deck on steel framing construction, but the concrete hasn't been poured in yet. You can see that we have columns right here. We have a series of major beams that go from column to column. And then we have purlins at some spacing in between the columns. Normally, I would have already done the lecture on sizing guidelines for you at this point. That's one of the things I'm kind of annoyed about about this switch up. Um, but you can see here that these are the smaller elements and they are picking up the metal deck. So the metal deck is spanning in this direction. It's like a series of little beams spanning from this beam to this beam to this beam to this beam. Um, this beam here is what we would probably call a purlin because all it's doing is supporting some metal deck. Its tributary width would go from there to there. This beam is probably what we would actually call a beam. Both are still beams, but this one is picking up a series of purlins. Remember, just like a river in the forest, the changing the name only has context in the bigger picture. They're all beams, but this is a beam that's not working that hard, and this is a beam that's working a little bit harder because it's picking up these uh, purlins. Uh, so we've got our columns, we've got our purlins, we've got our beams, we've got our concrete on metal deck. We've also got bracing. We've got bracing going in this direction and bracing going in this direction. Uh, we're going to look at some images of lateral load resisting systems later, but these braces would be our lateral load resisting system. And so they're stopping the building from racking. Here is a similar system, but instead of purlins, we have open web steel joists. These being the open web steel joists. We have metal deck spanning from open web steel joist to open web steel joist. 
So this open web steel joist right here is picking up that half of the metal deck and that half of the metal deck. So it's tributary width is halfway between those two and halfway between those two. Here is metal deck on open web steel joists and trusses. Look at these open web steel joists compared to these open web steel joists. These ones are uh, kind of lightweight. Um, they're the ones you're used to seeing probably when you go into a superstore or Walmart and look up. These ones, look at these, these are heavy HSSs with big pipes framing them out. Um, my guess is, is this is somewhere carrying a lot of load, a much more kind of industrial looking setting in fact too. These ones, again, picking up deck, um, so their tributary width is that, but then look, we've got a major truss here instead of a beam. So all beams can be replaced with trusses. Um, open web steel joists are basically lightweight trusses, so they'd be more equivalent to a purlin. So think of purlin and open web steel joist as interchangeable, and then think of um, girder and truss as inter interchangeable. A girder is just a beam that's working even harder than a regular beam. So maybe it has a column on it, maybe it's picking up other beams. Um, it's hard to know why they made this a truss. Um, maybe the loads were just that heavy. Maybe it was because they wanted to um, run mechanical services through it. Um, I can't know the story of why they did it in this one, but I'm sure they had a really good reason for doing it. Here is concrete on metal deck. You can see our metal deck is spanning in this direction. And you can see from the image above, and the framing is probably similar. Once you have a system for a building, unless you have a reason not to, you probably stick with that system. So you can see a series of purlins that, would, that are spanning this way that would be picking up the deck that is running that way. Um, and then on top of it, you can see that they're in the process of casting concrete on top. You can see that they have a welded wire mesh sitting on top of the deck. That's for crack control. Uh, it's not doing anything structurally, but it isn't helping to control how often our concrete cracks. When concrete cures, it shrinks, and over a certain area, it will predictably crack a certain amount. And so you could end up with all of that cracking happening in one spot with a big crack. Doing crack control reinforcing means you might have more cracks but they'll all be a lot smaller. So we're just controlling the crack. We can never eliminate concrete cracking. Uh, here is a composite deck and beam system. So under here, there is a steel beam. And what they're doing here is they're going to make the, uh, the concrete. So normally concrete and deck work together uh, to make our system. And we'll talk about composite systems uh, next term. But this, these little studs here are when we take the beam below and actually make them work together. I, uh, I'm going to try to draw you guys a little image and hold it up for you and see if that works. So what I'm doing is I'm drawing my my concrete on metal deck. I'm going to draw what these studs are. Because it's hard to see what's happening underneath there. But there is an eye beam underneath there. So if you can see this, we have a series of studs that are connected down to our eye beam. Like I said, normally I would be drawing this on the screen for you guys. And what this is letting us do is say that our beam isn't just our steel beam, it's actually all of this portion that I've colored green. So we've actually managed to increase the capacity of our steel beam. That's really effective in certain locations, but in the end, um, uh, we do find that it tends to have the ability to make vibration govern. Um, managed to throw all of my things before. So we don't do it a lot um, in Toronto. We certainly don't do it much um, if there's um, uh, uh, kind of a 
a live load criteria on it where people might be easily disturbed by a vibration. Hollow core planks on steel. Again, this one um, is concrete on steel is often the way it's built. And the, the hollow core is eliminating both the purlins and the metal deck or concrete on metal deck. So instead of having concrete on metal deck spanning uh, from purlin to purlin, which then spans to a beam, we now have our beams with our hollow core. So the hollow core is doing the job of two things now. Um, you can see in profile, it's a series of, well, it's extruded cores. They actually pull this through a machine as they cast this concrete, and there are tendons in it. What we're say saying, essentially, is that we have a series of beams that look like this. So if this is our extruded piece of co hollow core, we have a little beam right here, and then a little beam right beside it, and then a little beam right beside it. And all of these little beams are actually so close together, they're actually touching each other, which is really the concept behind metal deck as well. We have all of those flutes, and each flute is essentially a small beam. And we have so many of them together, they start to act as an entire, uh, they act as the floor as well. Uh, here is cast in place concrete on steel, not a common method of construction. You don't see that very often. Um, you might find that in a stairwell. Um, some building types might do it, but it adds some complexity to uh, scheduling. Um, a lot of unions or certain unions have contracts about who can be on site at the same time. Um, so they often can't be working there simultaneously. Other reasons are is that steel has a long lead time, but it goes up relatively fast when it gets to the site. Concrete has almost no lead time, but it's rather sequential and slow once it's happening on the site, giving them both finally the same amount of construction time. Or not construction time, time from starting the purchasing process to the finish line. Um, concrete construction will take longer, steel will be shorter, but it doesn't start until much later. So in the end, the time frame is the same. Uh, if you do cast in place on steel, you've now kind of gotten the worst of both worlds. Um, you have the slow concrete portion uh, combined with the slow steel portion because your steel can't keep going up until your concrete is done. This is an open web girder on metal deck system. This is kind of neat because the way they make it is they actually take these beams that look like this and cut them along this line here. And then they shift them and weld them back together. So they're increasing the depth of their beam. We're gonna learn next term why depth is so important, how that is the best thing we can give ourselves to make an element A, stronger, and B, stiffer. I'm going to eat your deck here just for fun because it sounds like I'm, I'm full of shit, but, but that's called a castellated beam. And I think it's because when they cut it, it looks like the top of a castle, the parapet of a castle, <laughs> and, then they, and then they slip them. But it legitimately is called castellated. <laughs> <laughs> I never knew the name I'm for it. I'm sharing that because architects like naming things. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have tried to spec this a couple times in uh, North America. It's not very common here. Um, I did see it um, when I was, well, because I'm still in the midst of slowly doing my master's in tensile fabric structures. When we were in um, Germany, actually at, at, the, at the Bauhaus school site, um, some of the newer constructed buildings actually use that system. Um, it uh, increases man hours and decreases material. Um, whereas we know that here in North America, our common economy is um, uh, uh, reduce man hours, increase material is our cheapest way to kind of go about it. 
Um, but these buildings were in East Germany, where uh, the economy was devastated for so long. Um, and uh, labor, I, I'm assuming that the labor was worth the reduced material costs for that particular project at that particular time. My guess is that was built in the early 90s, so probably shortly after the wall came down. Wouldn't you have guessed at the construction time of that building? Just looking at the, at the other things within it. Uh, I hate this image. I don't even know what the hell's going on in this one. Uh, I just like showing it to show what kooky things you can do. So this one, we don't normally stack our beams on top of each other. Um, normally we have our deck on top of our beams, but our beams frame into each other. You can go look at those typical details that I showed you guys, but I can, you're coming over, aren't you? You're yeah. nosy. You've never heard my, uh, no, no. my graduate core course lectures. So normally, this is my this is my husband Dave. He's also an engineer, and Everyone. he he appears now and then. Um, <laughs> like Snuffleupagus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they would all know Snuffleupagus as being visible. Oh. They don't know Sesame Street from my youth, not your youth, where Snuffleupagus was. Everybody thought Snuffleupagus was Big Bird's imaginary friend. No one but Big Bird ever saw Snuffleupagus. I'm assuming you guys are all in the generation who everybody saw Snuffleupagus. But this is, oh, this is normally how we frame a beam. If this is the purlin and this is the beam, the top of them are still at the same plane. So this system here that we're looking at is called the stub girder system. And, oh, right. Yeah. And uh, it was it was like the novel going to change the world system in the 90s. Because they were going to run all of their mechanical That's through right. there. And, you, and so you get this deep um, Verendil girder uh, with the slab as the top cord and the, and the, uh, and the wide flange beam as the bottom cord. Um, I don't know why it didn't take off. Like from a materials point of view, it's extremely effective. But uh, probably fabrication. My guess traction. is fabrication. Um, there's added fabrication by welding bees on. Um, probably they found a lot of the times the mechanical system once they actually finalized it, because the staging in kind of design, it's always this great idea. We'll run mechanical through whatever. But mechanical is usually quite a bit behind architecture and structure in their design. So structure is quite far along by the time mechanical gets past um, basically schematic and, and uh, design development stage and actually gets into contract documents. Um, so my guess is, is they would go through all this process and their mechanical units didn't fit and they ended up running it below and now they had this massively deep system that they couldn't take advantage of and people probably just got so frustrated that they said f it we don't want it yeah i'm sure this has been your experience i would say that at least two-thirds of the time um we will we will talk about running mechanical through structure and at least two-thirds of the time it winds up we we minimize the depth of the structure and run mechanical underneath because coordinating running it through is, is uh, so rarely. You will hear time and time again that one of the best things about Course Lab is that you can run your ventilation system through these cores. But look at this, <laughs> right here in this image. This isn't even the worst of it. That is just like the norm where they've had to cut it, where each of these panels sit side by side. Hi, Duncan where each of these panels sit side by side, these two cores up above, they need to actually connect those together so that they can't rotate relative to each other. Somebody actually comes along with a sledgehammer and smashes holes in it and runs little pieces of rebar across that they then fill the whole thing up with grout. So that, those two cores wouldn't be able to work, those two cores wouldn't be able to work. So you're reducing the amount of cores. If you have, um, uh, suspended system that you're grouting up into, um, uh, you're, you're basically removing probably 50% of what they're expecting you can use for your mechanical system. Maybe if you have a very basic plain building, that's a concept that works, but I've never had a project where uh, running mechanical through the hollow core would have been kind of a, an acceptable system. 
Here's a thing you don't see very often, um, a steel beam connected into a concrete column. Um, my guess is, is that this is a big concrete building, um, probably several stories high, and that this is a steel mezzanine within the main floor area. That is actually pretty common. Uh, it's a nice lightweight structure that they're coming in and installing into the concrete building after. They might have had some other reason. I'm not sure. I'm purely speculating here. Um, it's just, again, if this was a main floor in the building, my son just fell off the table, but he's okay. I'm just, just by the hockey sticks now. Um, uh, these concrete columns have to cure and before you can connect your beams. And if this is the floor, you have nothing to put your formwork on to start to do the next floor. Um, so this wouldn't be a normal type of construction. Here is an open web steel joist connecting into a concrete wall. This is more common, um, especially if this, is, this could be a steel building. It might not, we don't know. But this open web steel joist at the cores, where we probably have concrete walls, the open web steel joist most definitely would connect into the concrete. You can see that they cast in uh, anchors uh, with these clips and then the open web steel joist sat on top of it. This right here is a closure angle for the metal deck up above. So probably concrete on metal deck and they do that to either uh, to, to kind of close off the edge. It might be just metal deck, either way we usually have a closure angle. Uh, this is the Gerber system, um, or the Gerber girder system. Um, this system is really helpful. We haven't talked about moment yet, so this is going to be less helpful for you. Um, uh, but this system is really nice when you have the potential for multiple spans in something. Our moment diagrams, and we're gonna talk a lot about um, designing for moment very soon. So I'm just gonna show you how this changes the moment diagram. So the top image is what our moment diagram, so here are our beams, and this is our moment which is what we'll need to design for. If that is our worst case moment, we've got the same worst case moment on three beams. If we design it like this, we have positive and negative moment, but both of them are going to be smaller. So our overall moment could end up being less, meaning we could overall have smaller members. We have a cantilever now we have to worry about, um, but we still have three beams. Two of them are heavier, but one is uh, because they're longer, not because they're actually deeper or heavier, but just that they're a single entity. To hoist up in the air, they're gonna be heavier. And then one small light one. Um, when I've done this system, it usually shakes out to be a much cheaper system. Holes in beams. Um, we don't love putting holes in our structural beam. We can do it. I'm gonna give you uh, kind of a, a good rule of thumb. I'm, I'm gonna add it to this slide. Uh, I'm gonna even add it to post for you guys, so holes in beams. A quick rule is the one-third, one-third rule. If it's in the middle third of the beam and the middle depth of the beam, you can do it without reinforcing it. Don't do a square opening. You're gonna get cracking there. Do a round opening. Even if you're trying to fit something square through it, cut a round opening. If it's in the middle third, middle third, you don't even need to reinforce it. It's going to be working just fine. Um, because this part of our beam is doing all the work for shear. And we're going to see later in the term, again, normally you guys would have already seen this, um, shear is usually approaching zero at the middle of our element. So taking out some of the stuff work, doing the work to resist shear is perfect where we don't really have much shear. Um, you can always reinforce the openings. That's what this is right here. You can go ahead and reinforce the openings, no problem. 
it's a bit more work. Um, it wouldn't be kind of in the base building engineer's assumption of something that would be happening. Um, and sometimes it might be dependent on the fabricator. Would you do me a huge favor and get me some water? Um, uh, more holes in beer, bees. More holes in beer. Whew, that would be nice. Um, this is essentially a Verandil truss. So Dave mentioned this on the last one. We essentially have a series of moment connections everywhere here. Um, Verandil systems aren't always the most efficient. Um, we often do them where we have no choice. Um, this one was probably done to allow mechanical openings to pass through. Here's another one with holes in the beams. This is probably an industrial site that has uh, repetitive ductwork spanning through it. Um, but just to show you, you can see these larger ones where they're taking out majority of the steel. They actually reinforce them, but these smaller ones haven't been reinforced. The middle third, middle third, no problem. These ones here, the engineer might have had to do a calculation to see if it was okay and if they needed reinforcing. Uh, Z-girts. Z-girts are usually designed by the supplier. Think of them as um, uh, part of your cladding system. You often see them in arenas uh, where um, uh, they would be picking up um, some lightweight finishing. They're usually much closer together than joists or, or a purlin or open web steel joists or a purlins would be. Architecturally exposed structural steel. That has some uh, real guidelines um, that are available um, from the CISC or the Canadian Institute of Steel Construction. Uh, there's so many acronyms. Um, they have a, uh, a guideline that they've published on uh, structural steel um, or architecturally exposed structural steel. Dave and I have both given talks on um, architecturally exposed structural steel. And it's essentially think of it as broken up into um, the importance of how good you think it should look. There is basic where it's probably being hidden or you don't care if anyone sees it. Um, and then they have level one, two, and three, uh, and then custom, which is going to be a really high end profile things. This is the gold ring center for high performance sports, which you guys have the access to the drawings for these elements here are architecturally exposed structural steel. We talked, um, uh, last week about fire rating. Um, and so steel, as much as it's non-combustible in that it cannot, you cannot set steel on fire, well, you probably could at ridiculously high values, um, but it's not going to burn. Um, if, uh, if it is exposed to heat though, it can lose strength, meaning it's fire rating or it's fire resistance isn't very good. Um, what we can do to protect steel is put on intumescent paint. So these columns here are painted in a special paint um, rather than just normally what we would do for steel if it needs a higher fire rating than it can provide us. We'll put it in a box of some sort. We'll put it in the wall system where we protect it with some sort of fire protection like gypsum wallboard. That's our drywall. Um, but if we want it exposed, we can't really wrap drywall around this thing. Um, so what we can do is apply intumescent paint. Intumescent paint goes on with a slightly oil peel finish. You, you probably would recognize it if you went up and saw it. You'd be like, oh, that's what she means by intumescent paint. Um, and when it's exposed to fire, it puffs up really big. If you ever had those like um, little firecracker worm things that you set them on fire and they turn into this like long sinuous wormy thing that's made out of ash. That is a pretty much exactly what intumescent paint is. The second it's exposed to fire, it expands hugely, hugely and creates a fire protection around the steel column. Um, intumescent paint is ridiculously expensive. 
One of the things you can do to help um, uh, improve the fire rating of steel up to a point is increase its thickness. A code consultant can provide exact information on how thick your steel needs to be relative to its size and how hard it's working, um, what increased thickness you might need to make it meet that criteria. And if you think, that's crazy, why would we increase our steel thickness? It's because intumescent paint is so expensive that to do the same job applying intumescent paint would be way more expensive than just, if we could make it work by just increasing the steel, that would be the cheaper option. Sometimes that doesn't work architecturally because our member is now not the size we wanted it to be. Or um, uh, you are willing to accept, um, or maybe those sizes aren't available. Maybe we can't get it to work with steel. So in those situations, we'd want to apply the intumescent paint. We can do all kinds of really cool things once we start building up our steel. So instead of a single steel element, when we combine them to make trusses and joists, we can start to do really interesting things. It's a lot easier to curve a small thing than it is to curve a big thing. If you've ever tried to take um, a single piece of paper and curl it up, versus trying to take, a, well, this is really flimsy paper, but a stack of paper and try to curl it up. It starts to get a lot harder to do. Um, so steel, if we can curve the small pieces individually and then assemble them, um, we can start to get some really funky shapes. Uh, some steel details. I just wanted to show you some steel details on some typical buildings. You can see here that we have steel beams coming into columns. Um, here we have a steel beam coming into a beam. This one, look, I had said that normally the tops of them are the same, and normally that is the case, where the top of this and the top of this would be the same. But this one isn't, this one is raised, and I'll tell you why that is. Joists often do sit on top of a beam, and they have this little bit here, which is called the shoe. It's about four inches. For most conventional open web steel joists, it's about four inches. I'm gonna add that on for you too, for the details. I'm gonna add that little info, just because, why not, right? Um, so that's about four inches. And because this beam here is doing the same job as this, which is picking up the underside of the deck, we don't want our deck to drop down when it goes from these joists over to this, to this, from these beams over to this beam. So this one needs to be brought up to match the top of these joists. If we didn't have joists and these were all purlins, the tops would be at the same height. This is some kooky detailing where we've got some built up columns um, uh, and we come into particular joints. This wouldn't be common at all. Uh, we can do really long spans with steel joists. So you can see that we have nice deep joists. Look at these, these are slightly curved upwards. That's because we know we probably have something heavy coming in on this and we don't want it to deflect from the dead load and then deflect from the live load. So what we do is we camber it up for the amount we know the dead load is gonna drop it back down. And then our live load isn't going to move it that much. It's gonna take it from flat to whatever the live load is going to do to it. We can do really long span trusses. You can see that this is so big that they have to assemble it on site and they have um, uh, big kind of piers to support it until that time. Gold Ring had a setup very much like this, but it was such a tight site, it was hard to get a good picture that showed that view. Uh, here's another one. You can see here's one of the splice sites that they're going to put these parts together. Um, welding in the shop is the cheapest for uh, welding. Bolting in the field is the cheapest for the field work. So if you're doing steel, you want to weld in the shop and bolt in the field. Um, so anything that we need to do in the field, it needs to be able to be dealt with with bolts. This is just some cool steel kind of assembly. You can see them erecting this piece here. Um, 
we always, engineers love to name things as much as architects do. And the names of trusses is a thing that engineers get very, very worked up about. Um, I've been a long time supporter of saying that the name doesn't matter. Um, it's nice to have something to, uh, to have it a quick reference what you're talking about, but I think the math is the math and the best form will shake out. Although recently I learned there is something called the triple whipple truss and uh, my feelings have changed just a little bit ever since I've heard that just so that I can have the opportunity to design a project and say, I think the pro the solution here is a triple whipple truss. Um, I feel like I should just add in a triple whipple truss for you guys. I'm gonna add with the image of the triple whipple after pitched steel. Just, just so you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. It's, it, eh. it's actually a cool truss, but the name is actually the best part of it. Uh, you can do um, three-dimensional steel uh, elements. You can make a, a 3D space frame, or a, this one's actually a 2D frame, but they've made it um, wider. Like I said, steel, you can curve it. Um, it's best curved when it's um, smaller dimensions. Uh, steel has a curving radius that is directly related to its own personal depth. Um, so if you want to curve something, you should really check that. What, do you know what that curve rate is? is it, I've never been able to find published information on it. Yeah, inside radius, 1.5 times thickness. Depth. Depth thickness, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think of it in terms yeah. of bed, yeah, bed, bed plate. plate. And I've seen it as thin as one times. Oh. Okay, so that's the curving radius you can get. I'll, I'll add that into the slide so you guys will actually see it written on the slide. Um, here is some spray on fireproofing. It's not that pretty. Um, you guys remember in one of the first lectures, I showed you the image of the Native Child and Family Services uh, fam uh, headquarters um, on uh, uh, 30 call at 30 College, and it had that beautiful steel. Um, filigree of steel supporting the concrete and then they had to come along and fireproof it all. Uh, geodesic dome, curved frames. Again, I want to make sure we have time to go through all of the videos. Uh, Multi-story column. Often if uh, we're uh, erecting steel, if we can keep it as one piece, that's one less thing we have to erect. So if we can take two things and make them one piece, it makes it easier to erect or quicker to erect. So piece count can have a big part of the cost of steel as well. Um, so one of the places that can come in really handy is multi-story columns. So one column might only need to be designed as, you know, three, three separate uh, columns, but when they're erecting it, they might erect it in two pieces like that instead. It's important that the fabricator lets the base building engineer know that because where those two things are connected now, we had assumed a pin and we're gonna talk about pins and moment connections going forward. And now we have a moment connection, which means we might need to go back and check our design about something, of something. Wind columns, so these are columns that also have um, uh, girts that are that are framing into it that is going to pick up a cladding that is going to cause bending in our column. So now it's going to have axial load, but it's also going to bend. Um, an industrial building. Um, wind columns that have a tapered profile. These ones are in bending, and so where they're doing the most work is the middle is the middle of them. And so that's where the depth is the biggest. And I'm, we're going to learn over the next uh, term and a half that depth is the best way to deal with bending. Built up plate columns. Uh, again, this is that same kooky detail, but for built up columns. Cruciform columns, um, where we uh, uh, kind of have um, crossing pieces. Those are really popular. Uh, 
But what they are is they have to be three separate pieces. So often we have our middle piece and then two side pieces that get welded onto it. Architecturally exposed columns. And then you can even have truss columns. Again, not common. Um, we don't do it very often, but you can do it. You can see this is a kind of a big scale element. Truss columns again, cable stayed columns, so columns that are maybe at an angle. Masts, more masts, so again, they're cable stayed. And a trust mast mast or a truss mast. So this is at the center of a fabric structure. Um, you can see that uh, the, the actual fabric is helping to keep that column stable. So the column is carrying the gravity loads and then the system around it is keeping it stable. Think of it as a big circus tent post. Typical column bases. Um, we would often cast um, anchors in and then come in and set the steel on top of them and add the nuts. Um, one of the biggest flaws I tend to see on site is that these are cast in the wrong spot. Probably 60% of the time these anchors aren't exactly where they need to be. Um, we don't want to move where a column is because it changes absolutely everything else. Um, so it's often a good idea to expect mild disappointment for this detail. Or if you're going to have a problem, that's probably where it's going to be. Just a heavy duty column base. This is a heavy, unusual column base picking up bracing elements. You can see that what they had here was plates that were welded on here and holes. This beam, or this uh, brace element had this plate welded onto it. They came in, slotted them, it's really hard to see it. They slotted it in like that, and then put all of the bolts in. This is a column base with uplift. So if you're standing on your feet like this, and somebody tries to push you over, what you try to do is spread your base apart, or spread your feet apart. Uh, that's the idea with this, but you know that um, the further you spread your feet apart, the less likely the back foot is going to try to lift, lift up off the ground. Well, if we don't have the option of making something big enough, we have to deal with the fact that this side is trying to lift up out of the ground. So these are big rods that are cast way down into the concrete so that they can pick up a big wedge of concrete to stop that column from trying to tip up out of the ground. Uh, same thing here, just another way to detail it. Um, these are uh, some fancy column bases or columns looked at the base, looked at from the base. Uh, a steel arch. So we have load coming down. What's interesting here is we're gonna see this when we do free body diagrams or when we do um, uh, some kind of further in-depth stuff. This wants to kick out here. So we don't just have gravity loads, we have something that we need to resist going that way. We haven't really done um, uh, free body diagrams and method of sections yet, and we're going to get into that. So this image will make a bit more sense then. Suspension bridge, same thing, but upside down. And now we want to pull, these cables are trying to pull, and so we need something to resist the load here. You can see that what we've resisted it with here is the other side. Um, but over here, eventually we'll get to something that we are trying to pull up out of the ground. If you've ever seen bridges, you see usually at the end, or these kind of suspension bridges, at the end there's these big kind of buttresses down into the ground, and those are resisting that pull-out force. Um, some of these images we're going to see again in the lateral load resisting system, so we'll go through that one very fast. Diagonal uh, tension compression brace, meaning it will, take, it will take compression and it will take tension. Uh, diagonal brace 
base detail. You can see it starts to get pretty messy down there at the base. Uh, diagonal tension compression base uh, with a top detail, again, starting to get pretty messy. These ones would probably be tension only braces, meaning they you can pull on them for a load, but you can't put compression on them. So there needs to be one somewhere else that does the work in the other direction. Wind blows this way, this one's engaged. Wind blows this way, this one's engaged. You can have eccentric diagonal braces. Maybe they needed a doorway right here. And if the brace had come all the way over, it was gonna bonk someone in the head. Uh, using angles for braces. Um, we can do back-to-back -back channels. Rods, these would be tension only because they're rods. More rod bracing. Uh, large uh, object that's kind of three-dimensional in its behavior with rods for bracing. We can start to get some unique diagonal bracing as well. You can get some really kind of funky shapes going on there. Similar to trusses, bracing systems can have different names. There's K bracing and chevron bracing. Um, uh, so you can see we have these, double chevron bracing, V bracing, super bracing. So this is where that, that little bit there and that little bit there is the bracing for that floor. That little bit there and that little bit there is the bracing for that floor. But overall, you end up with a visible X bracing system. I love this image because I always like to talk about the fact that um, engineers tend to draw their bracing diagrams um, as stick figures. I have tried to get into the habit, so we often tend to draw this in our structural drawings and label these. I, for th just this purpose, try to draw these diagrams like this, so that we can see there's some depth to the number. I've actually even started to go so far as to draw a concept plate that I know roughly would work. Just to give the architect the opportunity to not be surprised when that's actually what they get. This is one where had they seen how hard this element was working, maybe they wouldn't have bothered with this. Maybe they would have just put a whole plate there. If they had welded up just the plate, maybe they could have gotten rid of a bunch of the work they had to do there. You can involve wood elements in your bracing. Again, the connections for it will always come back to steel. Um, so this, as much as it's wood bracing, is actually a steel connection doing the work. Eccentric bracing joint, bracing on a round building. Architecturally exposed bracing, where there's just this massive amount of bracing everywhere. If you guys have been uh, at 134 Peter at all, um, this is a really cool building that they came up with a unique way to have the lateral system from about somewhere above a four-story building uh, down to the ground. So these, they didn't have a name for this, but we've, they, we, they, they're called delta frames. Um, so I was working for Cast Connects while this was being erected, and Cast Connects were responsible for those cast nodes there. And actually, Dave's office is in is on the thirteenth floor of uh, of this building up here. Is the thirteenth floor measured from the ground floor, with the existing building being one, two, three, four, or are you yeah. thirteen? Yeah, yeah, because it's right. eleven story concrete building over a four-story existing building. Um, steel A-frame. So this was one of the things in our lateral load resisting systems. Um, we have a pin over here, a pin here, and then there's another pin over there. 
Uh, another one just to show you a moment frame system. Moment frames, moment frames. It's funny, I had a project like this where um, we had like some stubs sticking off because there was some things happening and this side had a ledge on it because they were picking up something for, for uh, uh, the roofing on the outside. Um, and it was a simple steel frame. That was all that was happening in the project. And it got installed backwards. It got, sorry, it got installed upside down and backwards. So as wrong as it could possibly be. So that's the steel lecture. Um, I'm gonna go right in to the wood one. And we're gonna start to do these faster. I'm gonna keep doing it as one lecture just so that I can keep an eye on the time that I don't bore you with too long of a lecture. There we go. Okay, so wood, wood can last a really long time. There's wood constructed buildings that have been around for a thousand years. Um, wood does shrink uh, as it dries out. Um, so sometimes you might need to stuff cracks uh, where there are wood elements um, or take some measures to deal with that. Um, but here's an old wood building. So here's where I was talking about wood um, shrinking. So this actually wasn't a perfect fit. So they filled it with oakum or some sort of um, stuffing material. Uh, and then often for these types of buildings, as the cross-sectional area shrinks, that gap opens up a little bit and you have to fill it back in more and more. Here's a really old wood building. You can see they built it out of a wood stick frame and then filled it in with brick and mortar in a very, very haphazard way. All right, conventional wood framing. We're not gonna spend a lot of time looking at this. I just wanted to show you some images. We will talk more about that. Um, I just wanted to show you images about what these things look like. So here is an image of conventional framing. Here you have um, your piers supporting your framing. We have our major beams or our beams and joists. Um, these joists here, this is a beam because it's picking up our joists. Purlins are, so we have open web steel joists that are steel. Um, the beam equivalent of an open web steel joist is a purlin. When we're talking about purlins in wood, we call them joists. I know, we like to keep everyone on their toes, but an open web steel joist and a purlin are equivalent for steel construction. When we switch to talking about wood, we call that, uh, we call that a joist. So joists are at some repetitive spacing and they're gonna pick up the plywood. Here's just another kind of conventional framing plan for wood. We've got um, our, our flooring, we've got, uh, we've got joists. You can see these joists sit on top of the beam. That is a common way to do wood, but often we'll connect into the side as well. Both are legitimate ways to do this construction. Girder, floor framing, floor sheathing. Once we do our lectures on sizing guidelines, I think it might be really helpful for you to come back and look at these slides. Uh, we have joists, plywood floor. We have a, uh, a, 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 a sill plate here. We have a double stud. Um, sometimes it's called the door jam. Uh, we have our lintel above the door, or sometimes it's called a, a header. The name changes around a little bit. And we have our stud. And our studs are like our joists, but tipped upwards. They're like the column a, a, equivalent of a joist. So here's an image of uh, some wood construction. This is a double stud wall system. Um, interestingly enough, my house is built in, or my new portion of my house, is built with this system. Um, rather than have uh, uh, a joist 
that's exposed to the out or has um, uh, you know our outdoor finish on it and our indoor finish if you ever touch a wall with normal joist on a really cold day, you can feel where the insulation is and then you can feel where the joist is and then you can feel where the insulation is. The idea here is that you stagger your studs and then all of that area in between can be filled with insulation. Um, here's a lintel. Sometimes lintels will be down at the height of the window, but often we might uh, use them up here because there's going to be floor framing sitting on this and then sometimes we might just build out the drop down portion. It really depends. Joists with metal hangers framed into the side of a beam. You can see that in this example the tops are flush. In this, in this example we have joists with a beam and you can see that the tops aren't flush. They're sitting on top of the beam. They need to be, uh, they need to lap each other and they need to be connected. Here's just another image of uh, joists, but these joists are connected to a ledger. So we want to connect into our concrete wall, but we can't connect our wood into our concrete easily. So what we do is take one member and run it all the way along the length and we'll anchor it into the concrete. And then we can come along with our joists and connect into this as if it was a beam. Just some images of joist hangers. Um, these are eye joists or um, wood joists um, that are built up. We're going to talk about this when we do sizing guidelines. Again, this is one of the side effects of doing this lecture uh, ahead of that. Um, so at least now you'll be familiar with what these things look like. Uh, again, we can cut holes in things, but it has to be checked. Um, typically, the rule is one-third, one-third, and you can get away with it for free. Um, these ones are more than one-third in the depth. Um, so the engineer would have had to check this to make sure that it was okay. Roof truss. So here are some of the roof truss names. Um, you can see that here's a triple fink, a modified fan, a double how, a triple how double cantilever, tri-bearing, double pitch, modified queen scissor, a how scissor. So there's thousands of different trusses with names that go with them. Um, really what we've got is top cord, bottom cord, and web elements. Roof trusses. You can see that these are expected to be hidden, mostly just because these aren't that pretty. I mean, maybe you want a very utilitarian look and they could end up being very, very gorgeous. Um, you can see that there's all of these trusses that look identical, except for this one. This is the end wall where we're going to have plywood attached to the side of it. So all of these ones in here are going to have big openings there. This one needs something to pick up the plywood. So these are every 16 inches to pick up the plywood. We're going to talk about where that 16 inches comes from. Uh, you can do a built-up beam. This is a built-up beam with a splice. So we need it to span a long distance, um, and a two-layer thick beam would work, but we can't get a member long enough. So what we do is we splice it here, but in this zone here, we only have two members until somewhere off screen um, we have another splice uh, where these two members are working instead. Here are some built out beam sections. Um, this would be two two by sixes mostly or two two by eights it looks like in this drawing. We can do three. We can even go up to four. You can do five. Uh, I try to steer clear of them. Um, you need to start um, really thinking about your screw pattern and they can they can be torsionally sensitive because they're not usually set right over our support. LVL, we're going to talk about what LVL is, but now you'll see that it is essentially an engineered material of wood. So bits of wood glued together. We're going to look at that explicitly later. Uh, PSL, another type of engineered wood. Flitch beam. Flitch beams are really fun. Um, here is an example where uh, 
to solve their beam problems, um, they needed four plies of one and three quarter inch engineered wood. Um, if their wall assembly was only six and a half inches, their beam would stick out and they still would need to put finishes on it. A flitch beam is when you include steel plates to help you do some of the work. So they're sharing the load out and we'll talk about that um, uh, further in, lecture, in um, structures two. But we've got three beams and two steel plates. So these are equivalent structurally because we have wood and steel doing our work and steel is so strong uh, and we can reduce our width down to five and three quarters inches. So maybe now we can fit that in our wall. Glue lamb is where we stack pieces of wood on top of each other and glue them together. This one has an NLT floor on it or a series of two by fours or two by sixes or two by eights stacked on uh, the long way side by side. So I'm gonna I'll draw you that. So stacked like that, on, sitting on top of a beam. Um, it used to be a really common construction type and then it kind of faded off for a long time and it's seeing a big resurgence. Um, would you say probably 50% 50 50 of the projects you see talk about doing CLT or NLT now? Oh, yeah. Like it's, uh, it's kind of just the thing that everyone wants to do now. Um, like steel, it's hard to curve big elements, but you can curve small elements. Glue lamb is a series of small elements glued together to make one big element. So if you can curve each of your small elements and then glue them together, you can get a much tighter radius than you would from the one big member. Uh, here's more curved glue lamb elements. Wood shear walls. So these are a thing that tend to be, um, when I get a call from a contractor kind of saying, you're crazy. It's almost always for a wood construction house. Talking about the requirements for the lateral or resisting system. And they often say, I've been building houses for 20 years. Are you going to tell me they're all going to fall down? I can say no, they're probably not. But this is what we have to do to satisfy the code now. So you can see here that our shear wall is being is being racked. There's a force pushing on it here. This side tries to lift up, this side tries to drop down, and the whole wall also tries to slide. Um, so you can see that it, it gets damaged very easily. What we do is we install these tie-down anchors. If we have multiple floors of this, we have to connect them with tie-down anchors. Um, we have very specific nailing patterns and requirements of these pieces of wood that go on our system. You can see that we have tighter requirements on the panel's edges. Um, so this is something that um, you should start to expect to see in wood construction or residential wood construction. Here's an image of what those tie down anchors might look like. Um, you can plate it um, and maybe you're connecting it into concrete or to the floor below. Uh, you can attach these tie down anchors that threads a rod down through, or you can actually connect them all together with a big rod. So as this tries to tip over, it pulls that rod up out of the ground. And if you drill it down far enough into the concrete, it's trying to lift up this massive chunk of concrete. You, know, you can see some installed down here. Uh, wood shear wall, just to kind of show you what we're looking at. Um, if you can't get, um, uh, or sometimes if, if, you're, if you're finding you're in a rush, some products like Simpson Strong Tie sell kind of pre-engineered um, shear walls where, they'll, where they will tell you what the capacity is. Um, we also need to prevent our racking of our floors. So the same way we have our walls going like this, we don't want our floors to skew. So that's our diaphragm system. It's quite common to brace 
the corners of, uh, of our, our deck columns. Um, this is essentially creating a small moment frame here. Remember how I drew the moment frames in the drawings as a triangle? Well, that's why. You can see we're actually replicating what's happening here. This is um, an actual real life example of that uh, representative diagram we draw. Uh, here is a diagonal bracing in a wood building. Um, these wouldn't work as um, a, a lateral system because they can slip past each other. As the building wants to rack, each one of those boards can slip relative to each other. So this building, the sheathing isn't enough. We need to add bracing. Here's that wood bracing image again. I love telling the story of this building. Um, so this is uh, Drew Mandel's project. It's actually his own house. Um, you can see that it was a very, very, very narrow site. Um, tall building, narrow site, and a chunk of it needs to be taken up with stairwell to move from floor to floor. Um, we, and it's very open with windows, and because it's so small, there's not a lot of room for walls down the length of the building. So we didn't have much in this narrow direction from top, stopping it from tipping over. I'm gonna drive this home again and again and again and again. That moment connections are expensive and hard for steel and wood. Concrete, we kind of get them for free when we build our concrete. But for steel and wood, they're really expensive and hard. A few options were looked at this, that looked for uh, for this project, um, putting steel frames in at locations were looked at, but it took away too much of the floor space. It interfered with the, uh, the stairwell, um, so that wasn't an option. Um, we looked at bracing in a few spots um, to have narrower members, but that cut the flow through, it was so, so narrow, you couldn't pass people through easily. Um, uh, was it you that suggested doing the the wood moment frames? Yeah, they're like they're like gauge steel. Oh, why are they like gauge steel? Yeah. I don't. I think I've always thought they were uh, wood. Anyway, it does. The concept is the same. It doesn't change anything. So what it is is a series of moment frames. So you can see that every one of these connections now needs to be a moment connection. So we've got six moment connections per frame. Trying to stay within the depth of a normal system, a uh, wall system. So normally for a building, we would have a few discrete lateral loads resisting systems down the building's length. So if I drew a plan view, you know, we might have if this is a plan view, we might have a series of lateral load resisting systems like that. This project had lateral load resisting systems every eight inches. How many screws did you need per connection of the light gauge? 16 more, I think. So every one of those connections, which there was six of per frame, needed 16 specialty screws to connect the frames together to develop the moments. And then these frames happened every eight inches down the length of the building. I'm going to show you slides at the end of this course that show that even if a moment frame is as strong as a brace frame, it's way less stiff. So it can move more. Um, so some of that was about trying to meet the deflection criteria, but it just cleared the deflection, deflection criteria. Um, I remember talking to Drew after um, Hurricane Sandy hit New York because it still had a big impact um, kind of on um, us here. You could really feel the wind. It was quite intense still. I remember I was at my cottage in Nip Lake Nipissing and it was, it was almost terrifying to be in there. Um, Drew said that he remembers 
laying in bed and feeling the building rock back and forth. But he said there was no damages to finishes, no cracked windows, and he understood, we had made it very clear to him that it would be way more flexible than he's used to, but it would be just as strong as it needed to be. So Drew just kept laying there at night saying, stiffness is not directly related to strength. Stiffness is not directly related to strength. Um, and we're going to see that play out again and again throughout this these series of lectures, including into next term. Connections for wood are the governing factor. Uh, we talked about that last week. So wherever you connect wood to wood, you often need steel. There's a big movement to make wood still be the connector from uh, wood to wood um, using dowels and other joining methods, um, and that's seeing a real resurgence as well. Um, but often they're big, ugly connectors. They don't have to be ugly. It's just that's the cheapest, quickest way to make it work. Otherwise, you have long lead times. Wood connectors. This is one that I like to show because it's kind of like that braced frame one where you're expecting um, these delicate little connections and by the time the forces are developed, you might as well have had this be a steel frame. Here's how you might connect wood to concrete. This would be cast in, you'd cut a hole, uh, you'd slice a line uh, through your column and connect through it, or maybe you set your whole post into this and bolt through it. Um, steel to wood. Often our steel elements are supporting um, uh, masonry, which is very uh, uh, deflection sensitive. Um, even still, steel to wood, our wood has the tendency to shrink, leaving, and our steel is uh, kind of, can, can be left hanging all by itself. So we really need to think about where we have large um, interfaces or where we have interfaces between different types of material. Uh, here's a unique construction. This is the one that Dave and I did. Um, uh, again, NCFS uh, uh, um, headquarters, and this is the longhouse inside the building. Each one of these elements is only a, about this long that could be picked up. This system wasn't stable until it was fully installed, um, but then once it was installed, it was fully stable. Dave and I give whole talks about this. In fact, we're giving a talk um, about this style of construction, which is reciprocal frame construction, um, to uh, the wood industry in Melbourne, right? Or are they just based in Melbourne, in Australia, whatever. Um, so here we can use wood in bridges. You can see we have it curving, it's engineered. We've got all of our connectors. Um, this one might be a wee bit over-designed. You know, I'm not gonna, maybe this was the look they wanted. It might've been um, extracted from a very clear idea as well. Um, uh, so we don't know everything that's going on with this. This is a building I did in the mid 2000s. Um, we had really wanted this to be a reciprocal frame, um, but nobody really bought into the idea of it. So instead it's large beams spanning in this direction with smaller infill beams, um, kind of going from member to member. Here we have uh, NLT. Um, with concrete topping on it. Like I said, NLT is having a real kind of resurgence. Um, often we still need the concrete topping um, for a wear surface, for vibration, um, sometimes for fire rating. Um, so there's lots of reasons why we still need our concrete surface on top of our wood. Um, here's the underside of an NLT floor system. We've also got um, glue lamb uh, beams and columns, NLT, CLT. CLT is all the rage. It is plywood built out of a series of two by fours and two by sixes. So you can see here, um, you still have the look of the wood um, uh, and we'll talk more about all of these engineered wood products later on. 
This is, uh, I'm assuming I'm allowed to share this. This is, and I should change the name of it. Um, what, it what are you guys calling it now? Infinalam. Infinalam. This was kind of a placeholder name, but somebody went and took the trademark to the name, uh, kind of before they, that they shared it with someone and somebody trademarked the name. Anyway, Dave believes in sharing ideas. Um, there's a chance this will be the thing that makes us rich. Most likely it'll be the thing that makes someone else rich. <laughs> the thing that makes us poor. <laughs> um, where it is um, a, a, a combination of CLT or NLT with um, voids cast into the concrete. So the wood and the concrete are working together, um, but you're taking out a huge portion of the weight of the concrete. There's lots of really, really smart reasons why this is the best, not the best, a really good system when you're looking at um, kind of mass timber flooring construction. Um, you can get longer spans. Um, you're using all your material more efficiently. Um, you can actually end up bringing the cost down compared to equivalent ones. So there's all kinds of really cool reasons. Um, nothing's been built yet, but it's, uh, it's specced on a bunch of projects, not even just Blackwell projects, um, but other other engineers are looking seriously at this to kind of construct with. Wood. Everybody just wants to talk about the future of wood. So here are some um, projects that are, are kind of in the works now. Almost everything is on hold because of COVID, but these are kind of the, the kind of all of the rage construction. Here's the Gold Ring Center for High Performance Sports that I did. And when I did it, I designed it for a future basement. We didn't know what the building was going to look like. And so now U of T is beginning this process. We're actually quite far along in it. Um, uh, it's not my baby anymore. I, I handed it off to uh, someone in Dave's office. Um, but I did all of the preliminary analysis for this. Um, um, so this is, where is this in the process? You probably, some of you might have even seen this model in the U of T building. Um, I'm ready to start construction documents. Construction documents getting ready to go. Um, this was a competition for uh, George Brown called the Arbor. Um, this was the project that Dave and I worked on. This was ultimately the, the winning project. They're all kind of really gorgeous, gorgeous options. Uh, CAMH, um, another wood contender. Um, and in North Bay, surprisingly one of the tallest wooden, wood buildings kind of happening in Canada is in North Bay, which is really cool. So that's our, our wood um, lecture slides. Again, we're going to talk more about these things. I know you don't know what all of these elements are. Um, normally, you would have seen, heard all about them, and then I showed you pictures. This way, we're doing it where I'm showing you all the pictures. So as we start to talk about it, you can be like, what the hell was that again? Oh, yeah, I'm going to go back and look at that picture so I can remind myself of what it looks like. So let's do our concrete construction images. Ooh, I'm getting thirsty and tired. Okay, concrete is really two things. Concrete is concrete and steel. When we're talking about concrete, we're talking about reinforced concrete. That means what you see is the concrete, but there's also steel hidden within that concrete. Here are some examples of concrete columns. So if that blue line is the outside of the concrete, the red and the pink is the steel inside the concrete. And here they are in elevation. We've got our reinforcing and we've got these elements that are, oh, how about I put it on slideshow for you? And these elements, oh, now I can't see, there we are. And these elements are the ties. All of our steel kind of needs to be tied together. Um, so as you get more and more, you might get more and more complex layouts of ties. We can do circular columns as well. We can 
get round formwork and we can cast this, uh, this concrete in the round form. Again, we still need, just remember they can see you in the mirror. So like, don't take your shirt off and stuff. I don't know what's happening there. <laughs> um, we can have, uh, uh, we still need our reinforcing inside these columns. You can have all kinds of kooky shapes for concrete columns too, because we can do um, formwork. We can really do refined things in formwork. Concrete beams. Here's what a typical concrete beam looks like. We have our steel that's working for us, which is usually on the bottom. Concrete is really bad in compression and, uh, sorry, really bad in tension and fantastic in compression. So if I have something in bending, you can see the top is squashing and the bottom is stretching. You can see in that image there that the top is actually squashed and the bottom is stretched when they were all kind of even the whole length of the whole depth of it prior. So up here, the concrete's doing all the work. Down here, the steel is doing all the work. Steel is fantastic in tension. Here's kind of a typical uh, concrete beam cross section. Our ties, our ties are doing our work for shear. We'll get, we'll, we're gonna get into that a lot um, in structures too, but I just kind of wanted to show you what the reinforcing looks like in here. Concrete um, can be cast a few different ways depending on what it's doing. This is a flat plate under here. Remember that I said that Concrete doesn't do well in shear, especially punching shear. And I showed you that failure image where a slab slipped down relative to a column. So often we'll reinforce around the column zone or we'll make the concrete thicker to help beef up that zone to prevent that punching shear. Or maybe that's still not enough and the problem starts out here, so we thicken our slab with a drop panel here, but at the column, it's really still a problem, so we add a capital. Um, this is a concrete beam with a concrete uh, uh, beam system with drop beams spanning in one direction and a slab spanning in the other, making it look more conventionally like um, a, a steel system or a hollow core on beam system, where we have our columns, our beams, and then a, a slab spanning to them. We can do something very intricate with a waffle slab. Um, in concrete, where our top is in compression and our bottom is in tension, um, the concrete is doing all the work at the top, and so it needs the whole area doing the work. Our steel is discrete, so maybe we only need steel in these discrete spots, but we need it to be protected by the concrete. Well, we could then maybe remove all of the concrete we don't need. This takes a ton of formwork. You saw a lot of it in the 50s and 60s. The number one thing that drives construction is cost. We want to make our systems as cheap as we possibly can as long as we've met our other requirements of design considerations. Um, so it's not to say our building has to be cheap and ugly, but we want the cheapest system within our requirements. In the 50s and 60s, man hours or labor, man and woman hours, was cheap and material was expensive. So we would do whatever we could to remove material, even if we had to throw more labor cost at it. So having someone take the time to form all this out was relatively cheap because labor hours weren't expensive and we saved a ton of material. Our economy is switched now. Labor is our big cost and materials are relatively cheap. So it's not like we don't know how to still build beautiful sculptural concrete uh, works. It's that before it was actually economical to do it, whereas now it's not really economical to do it. Filling in those voids is the cheaper thing to do now because material is uh, cheap and labor is expensive. <laughs> 
funny. We're at a funny cusp right now where we don't know really what is going to drive construction economy in growing, going in years going ahead. Um, kind of a less common way to do it, but you can actually form purlins into beams onto columns. So here you can see that kind of steel kind of methodology shown in a concrete system. Um, here we have um, beams with a one-way slab. We're going to look at in depth at what a one-way slab and a two-way slab is when we do our sizing guidelines. So I'm not going to spend any time talking about that right now. Two-way slab where our slab is spanning to all of the beams on the perimeter. Concrete, like I said, because we build it with formwork, which doesn't have to be that, it just needs to be strong enough to hold up the material, can often be quite thin, usually it's plywood with some supports. We can do really sculptural shapes. Um, again, the same with the steel. If we have that arch shape, when our load is coming down, we have the tendency to kick out, so we need something to resist it. Hollow core, which is more common in... Um, our uh, steel construction, the material itself is actually concrete. Uh, it's made in a shop. It's got a beautiful smooth surface on the bottom and they cast in these tendons that are stretched tight. You can see here what I was talking about that um, all of these have been bashed out. There's gonna be rebar that goes through here and grout put through all of those. So you can see here uh, three out of the one, two, three, four, five, six of, or this one looks like it has seven um, of those flutes are actually going to be blocked from air passing through. Um, precast, uh, we talked that pre about precast existing. Um, here's a precast T-beam. Uh, here's a precast double T being installed on site. So this has been cast in a shop. What's really nice is that it's going to have a nice smooth surface. You can go back and look at all of the advantages and disadvantages. Here is um, uh, the bubble deck system, which is um, the bubbles um, that these bubbles were developed um, to go in concrete slab systems where they use a precast bottom panel and then put the plastic bubbles in and then cast concrete on top. Um, Dave's idea of doing that with wood as the base element really came as a driver out of this bubble deck system. Um, you can see that they're walking around on this with just some big rubber boots. Um, this is actually uh, what was used for the construction method um, at One Spadina. So uh, the, most of the concrete floors have these bubbles um, embedded in them. Here's a whole little precast building that was built in a shop and being lifted into site. Tilt up construction, not that common here, but you cast the ground, you cast the slab, you put a slip break under there, you cast your wall, and then you get a big crane and erect it into place. Um, and until the rest of the construction is done, you need to support it somehow so it doesn't just tip over. Super common where I'm from in Nova Scotia. Uh, a few other precast products. Precast columns. Let's take a look at some concrete walls. There's not a lot to show up for them. If you've got a wall, it's probably a sheer wall. Once you've got it, you might as well use it. Um, here's a concrete core being built. This might be a concrete building. It might be a steel built building. Actually, it looks like it is going to be a concrete building. Um, but that core is where all of the services run. So elevators, stairwells. Again, if you've got it, and it probably, even if it was a steel building, probably needed to be concrete because of the fire rating. Remember that steel doesn't do well and concrete does in a fire rating, even though they're both non-combustible, um, that doing your core out of concrete is really helpful because you've got fire separation with something that's fire rated for your stairwell. Uh, and then just a kooky image of a concrete moment frame. Again, not a common 
construction method, um, although it does appear now and again. I did a, um, a renovation on a building and no matter how I modeled it, I could not see how they were resisting their lateral loads. There wasn't enough wall anywhere. And then finally a colleague and I were talking and we were like, yeah, it's almost like they have moment frames. And it was like a little bell went off and we said, let's look at it as if they had actually designed it as a moment frame, which would have been really surprising at the time just for the um, kind of the analytics of it. And we went through and we analyzed it as a moment frame. Um, we found that it seemed to actually be the load path and to satisfy myself, I went back and found and looked at the structural drawings and see if the reinforcing they had in it would have been strong enough to resist those moments at those spots and they did so it really was the design method they had used it wasn't the one we were expecting um, and it was really interesting to see that play out um, i just wanted to show you some normal basic stuff and what it looks like so here's a footing um, uh, you can see one with the reinforcing in it We've got dowels for our concrete and the first few bits of ties because they're probably going to get kind of cast into the concrete. Um, and you can see that they're going to come and fill this with concrete. Uh, a rebar slab. Often we'll use chairs, these little plastic things to hold it up, but using a chunk of concrete is just fine. Um, something that's rough, if it's going to be big, it needs to be rough so that it's engaging that uh, concrete. As it cures. You can see why quality control in concrete can be difficult. That is a lot of rebar that you need to go through and do check counts, you need to measure lap lengths to see if this actually conforms to the structural drawings. There is small amounts of structural elements everywhere on the project. With steel you have large elements discreetly placed. Here's just kind of an image that hides the concrete a little bit so you can see what's happening inside um, a concrete beam. Here's another one where we have um, a column um, that maybe has more compressive loads and where it meets um, a slab or a footing. Here's a foundation wall getting ready to be cast. You can see it's formed. There's gonna be reinforcing in there and they'll come through and um, place the concrete. You can imagine that if there is a filigree of reinforcing in there, making sure our concrete gets down here the way we want can be really difficult. So they use um, a concrete vibrator to make the concrete get down into all the spots. One of our big risks is honeycombing, um, which is where we get spots that don't completely fill out all the voids and we need those filled out. Here's another image of one where we've got formwork in place with reinforcing. We're below grade, so we can tell that this is a foundation. Um, we've got plywood formworks um, uh, on a foundation wall that are just being stripped. All good? All good, Jackie? Yeah. All right. Um, and so you can see here that there's elements cast in here. My guess is there's columns or something coming in here that's going to be attached to this. Um, so on those, um, those drawings that didn't have a basement, remember we said unexcavated in the middle? There's our unexcavated zone right there. Uh, here's the plywood forms to do a slab. So this is before the reinforcing even goes on. You can see that we do need to build our building twice. This is a series of wood elements that are supporting our uh, formwork that's gonna have the reinforcing put on it and then the concrete cast. And then all of this bit will come and be taken away. Uh, just an idea, just here's um, an example of plywood formwork. Um, so here would be the beam form, here's the slab form, and then here's everything that it takes to support it. This is all the scope of the contractor. We tell them what this needs to be, and they have to design this to support the temporary loads or the loads of the wet concrete. And here's an example of them taking it from one of the floors below and bringing it up to do a floor below above because it's the repetitive formwork going up. This is called flying the forms. 
Um, early 2000s, a new um, kind of um, formwork company hit the market called Perry Forms, and they really took over the industry in Toronto. Uh, you can see Perry Forms. You can do fiberglass forms for those round columns. It can give you a really nice, smooth finish. You can do board formed concrete. Look, where it'll take on the atmosphere or the image of what it's cast against. Normally we spend a lot of time trying to get rid of that, but if you want, you can amplify that effect. Um, Durasol is a company that produces insulated concrete formwork where we actually, instead of using um, plywood forms that we take off, we use um, um, insulation. Um, it can be foam insulation. These guys use this kind of um, proprietary material. Um, because these come with clips in them to support the rebar, because we still need our rebar in these elements, um, we have found that it's slightly harder to vibrate these systems, and we often get honeycombing down here at the bottom. Um, so you can see exactly why, that these are now within the system, not just the thin bars. Um, concrete placing is not a very scientific work. You can see it just comes at the back of a big truck. It's a big, wet, gooey mass. Um, it's not quite solid. It's not quite liquid, though. People think of it as, like, running. You can, you can see that you could kind of form this up a little bit, smooth it out, and you could probably, you can do some sort of tapering with it if you need to. Uh, these always amaze me. It doesn't even look like it is possible for this to get over here like this, but here's the concrete truck over here. Here's where the concrete's coming out over here. The alternative is they pour it into a big bucket and there's a crane here that comes over and hoists it and opens it up and spreads out the, let the concrete out. Here's someone finishing the concrete. Um, there's a few stages to finishing the concrete. Um, that can often come down to the architectural works component of it, depending on what kind of finish you want, but that would be back and forth between the engineer. Load-bearing block walls. I'm going to lump masonry in with our concrete stuff because it's really tiny precast elements stacked together. So you can see um, masonry similar to our hollow core. Where we need to, we just smash things out with a sledgehammer to get our reinforcing in. These out, you can see here's a plate that's being um, kind of placed within the masonry, um, and these these um, joints here would be grouted. So we fill these with grout. Uh, this is a non-load bearing block wall. So it comes up uh, to some height, but it's not picking up the roof. We have to be really careful about this and you'll see some details um, in my, uh, in the typical details. If you go to the masonry section, um, we don't want it to carry load but we do need it to be braced at the top. So we have a few different details we can do, but this is probably the most common. So this is drawn to represent the roof. This is our non-load bearing block wall. This is a clip. This is one way to do it. There's other ways to do it too. That is a clip that has a slotted hole where it connects to the wall. So as the roof goes up and down with the loads it's taking, that clip can slide, but the wall can't tip over because it's braced by the clip. Um, here is a, uh, a feature wall. What's really cool about this one is they had a pattern of blocks further up the building that are actually, where's this image, actually tipped on their side. They didn't do it on the lower floors because they had fire rating um, uh, things happening on the other side of that wall. But as they went up, they started to let that open up. Um, so the reinforcing had to be very carefully 
coordinated between myself and the contractor for that. Ah, look at that. I have a detail for a non-load bearing block wall top. Um, so here's another way to do it, that this just slips up and down relative to the block. So this is one that needed to be a fire gap as well. And so this is filled with compressible material. So we meet our fire rating requirement um, where fire can't pass from one side to the other um, or not easily. Um, the roof is carrying the load and not transferring it to the masonry. Masonry has been around for a long time. We can do um, piers. And concrete um, has some cool things coming up in it. I'm not as kind of keyed into that as I was when I was in university because um, where I went, they did a lot of research on concrete. They were kind of heavy on that. Um, but you can even get translucent concrete. Um, it would be ridiculously expensive. Um, but you can see that there's opportunity for kind of innovative, cool things there. Okay, let's look at our foundation lecture. I can tell you that you have a few assignment questions from this. Oh, look at this. Spread and strip footings make awesome exam questions, which means they make awesome assignment questions as well. Um, let me just get this in slideshow format. So let's go through our foundation slide. There's a few small calculations in here. Um, I might just talk them through with you. Um, uh, the work, the, the worked out solution is provided. Um, they're not complex. So the role of the foundation is to transfer the building loads to the ground. We have our up and down loads, we have our side to side loads, and our building tries to tip over. Our foundation needs to not fail. It can't experience unreasonable amounts of settlement. And there are two types of settlement we are worried about. We're worried about total settlement, settlement and we're worried about differential settlement. So if one side settles more than the other side, we're still gonna have a problem. And then the last thing we worry about, or one of the other things we worry about, is it needs to not heave. Um, and that means in Toronto and most of Southern Ontario, we have to take our foundations four feet below grade. If we go four feet below grade, we've eliminated the possibility that water, water doesn't freeze below four feet below grade um, in our climate. Um, so the water below our foundation won't freeze because what happens when water freezes? It expands and if it expands, it hoists up our foundation or it heaves our foundation. So what does settlement look like? I'm feeling really embarrassed because some of I, I have never updated some of these slides from this lecture. So these are your old ones from when you taught this course years and years ago. Um, almost everything else I've redone and reworked, but there's a couple that I've kind of kept for his own personal, uh, um, uh, from his own personal slides. Um, so what is settlement? Um, if we have a bunch of particles that are hanging out in this shape, maybe something comes along, shakes them up a little bit, and now they've realigned into this shape. So that's settlement due to realignment of particles. If we have um, uh, uh, lots of water mixed in amongst our particles, maybe it dries out. And as it dries out, our element shrinks. So we have settlement due to depletion of moisture. Maybe we have big elements and small elements and water comes rushing through and our fine elements get kind of pulled away and now our big elements can crunch down together. So settlement due to the migration of fine particles. Differential settlement is when we get more settlement on the other side of one side than the other. Um, the foundation information is usually, get, well, I'll, I'll come to this in a second. So one of the things we can do is maintain low bearing stresses we can proportion footings for equal bearing capacities, or we can bear footings on the same soil type. So if these are two different types of soil here, because our soil profile goes like this, maybe we need to bring this footing 
down to here right off the bat so that this wall is longer and our footing is down here, but now they're both doing their work on the same type of soil. How can soil fail? This is one of the things that people always ask. Um, if we overload our foundation in bearing, it compresses the soil and the soil pops out the side and forms a bulge. Um, if you've ever taken a ball of Play-Doh or bread dough, when you push down in the middle of it, it falls out the side and that's essentially what we're doing here. We end up with something called a shearing plane. We're not going to get into that, that's way beyond this course. So the information about the soil isn't done by the base building engineer. In fact, we are not allowed to make the decisions about the soil. We have it very strictly in our um, association and our clauses that we don't make that assumption. The geotechnical engineer also does not work for the architect or the engineer. You guys as the architects often hire me. The owner hires you and then you hire me and the mechanical engineer and the electrical engineer and the building science engineer or a code consultant. The one thing neither of us can do is hire the geotechnical engineer. The owner has to do it and that's based on liability. But the owner doesn't know what to tell the geotechnical engineer. So we will often act as a liaison between the owner and the geotechnical engineer. So technically they're working for the owner, but communication usually goes through our team. Um, the consulting team will create a report and say, geotechnical engineer, here's what the owner needs from you or a terms of reference. And they'll say, we need test pits, this many test pits at places where they literally dig a hole and see what the soil is like. Or we need boreholes where we dig down a little bit and pull the soil up and test it. Um, we can add in auger boreholes or percussion boreholes. Those are just fancier borehole types. Usually some of this information would be that we do um, a terms of reference and the geotechnical engineers that the, it goes out to say, you might want to consider this. So there might be some back and forth. The geotechnical engineer will produce a report that provides the bearing capacity for strength, the bearing capacity for settlement or serviceability. They will give us earthquake criteria and they will say the required depth our footing needs to go, both to meet that bearing for strength and settlement and for frost. And they will often give us a recommended foundation construction type. Um, sometimes they might give two possible options. Most of the time it's going to be spread and strip footings. That's ubiquitous, that's the norm, or at least here. Um, if we are on really crappy soil, they might make alternate suggestions. Um, I can't stress the importance of a geotechnical report on large projects. It is required, and a lot of the engineering is dependent on that geotechnical report. I had two projects in the past year and a half with accelerated schedules where they said that, we're, that we were working for cities who should understand this the most. Um, and they begged us to do accelerated schedules. And I said, we can do it, but you're taking on the liability that you haven't gotten your geotechnical report yet. And they said they understood that. And I said, this is fine as long as there's no surprises. I said, I'm even gonna do some research and find buildings nearby that have some kind of past history. Both projects, had surprise fallouts in the geotechnical report. One, there had been construction on the site that no one had known about previously. So we had really, really, really bad soil. The other one, we were just in a weird location with bad soil and we couldn't do our standard soil construction. Um, so at the last minute, two weeks before we were supposed to go for tender, we had to rework the complete foundation system. Um, as much as I had expressed that to the owner, um, they were still annoyed about the delay and rather than pay me more, which is what they should have done because I had designed it for them once without them providing me the proper information, they refused. Um, but I wasn't going to let a project die because of that. Um, I went through with it anyway. 
So as much as we need that geotechnical report, we can make some preliminary assumptions. And we know that often these are the norms for soil type. Um, uh, so stiff clay might be 150 kPa. Um, till might be 200 kPa. Um, and note here, this says allowable. Allowable is all about serviceability. To achieve bearing capacity, the soil must be undisturbed, so it can't have been dug at before. There can be no organic materials, and the excavation needs to be cleaned by hand. It needs to be smooth. It, it can't have big chunks and bumps in it. That's essentially what that's saying. You don't need to get down there and pick every tiny little stone away, but it needs to be relatively smooth. The most common foundation type in Southern Ontario is spread footings. Those can be a strip footing below a wall or a pad footing below a pier. So bearing capacity must be greater than the bearing pressure. So we need our reduced capacity to be greater than our factored load. Bearing capacity is or bearing is equal to force divided by area. So P is our force, A is our area. If PF is our factored load and area is our area of bearing. So that's essentially how our spread footings work. We have, so think of it this way. Um, if you've ever walked um, on grass in high heels, you know you sink through the dirt. You put on um, blunt stones, you're spreading the same load over a bigger area, you're not gonna fail the soil. If you then wanted to walk on the snow, you need to, you need to spread your load out over an even, even bigger area, which is our snowshoes. So if P stays the same, changing A and making it bigger and bigger and bigger, we can reduce our BF. So if we aren't meeting our required bearing, we can change our area. So let's take a look at an example. We have a column with a total load of 1,000 kilonewtons, and it sits on a spread footing bearing on till. Assume that a square footing of dimension X or D by D will be used. So it's going to be the same dimension on both sides. It's square. What is the minimum dimension D that can be used? Remember, our footing can be bigger, but it can't be smaller than what we need. We can over-design it, but we can't have it smaller than that. So we see that we have, um, it gave us a load of 1,000 kilonewtons. So P or PF is 1,000. Um, we don't know what our area is. Our area is what we need to figure out. Um, but they did say that it's bearing on tilt. Now, normally a geotechnical engineer would give us this information, but this is our preliminary design. Let's go back and look at till. We've got 200 kPa. So we are saying that we have 200 kPa. We can use 200 kPa as our BR. We want to make sure that's bigger than BF. So let's set those two things equal to each other and see what area exactly makes our BF 200. So let's Let's say BF exactly works. It is exactly the, the limit we can have, so 200. If we set 200 equals to 1,000 divided by our area, we can rearrange that and we bring our area over and we have 1,000 divided by 200 and we're going to get five. So our area is five meters squared. We had KPA, um, and we had kilonewtons, so that's going to give us an answer in meters squared. Um, our area, that works great, but they've asked us what is the dimension of that. Well, our area is D times D. We, want, we have our area, so the square root of 5 is 2.236. So ask yourself, if what makes the bearing 
uh, exactly 200 kPa is 2.2367 meters by 2.367 meters. That's a funny thing to form out. You want to make it to some probably an even two inch increment, so something at the 50 mark. So would you make it um, uh, would you make it 2.23 or would you make it 2.24? Would you go up or down? If we make it go up, we've got a bigger area, which means our BF goes down, keeping our BF below our BR. You can make that dimension bigger, but if you make it smaller, you're going to have a failure. I personally would always round to the nearest 100 millimeters for something like this. I can't remember. I have, I have to see what the answer is here. I go through the math. So we looked up the bearing capacity for till. Um, we, we knew uh, 1,000 from the questions. We can rearrange this. We get our 5 meters squared. We get an answer of 2.236. I would probably round that to maybe uh, something nice and smooth at 50 millimeter increments. Um, so 2.25 meters. I might on a different day make it 2.3, but 2.25, they often form things in 50, milli increment, 50 millimeter increments. Why? Just because it's a few less decimal places to carry around for everything. Um, if we were in inches, we might do it in the equivalent inches, so they'd be off just a tiny little bit. Um, but we're dealing on a metric project here. They gave us all the values in metric. We're going with our metric uh, uh, answer here. So our footing, D, would need to be 2.25 meters. So let's just double check that. We've made it bigger. We have 2.25 by 2.25. Our area is 5.0625 meters squared. Let's divide our 1,000 kilonewtons by that. We get a BF of 197.5. So we have met the criteria of BF being less than BR. Let's do the same thing, but for a wall footing or a strip footing. Um, we have a wall that has 20 kilonewtons of load every meter of wall length, and it sits on a strip footing with a width, width B. It's on loose sand. What minimum dimension would we need for B? Um, well, we know our load is 20 kilonewtons per meter. We can go find out what our sand is. So loose sand or gravel, 50 kPa. So we looked up the bearing capacity for loose tiller sand and we got 50 kPa. Um, we know that our force is 20 kilonewtons per meter, but let's look at this as one meter of wall. Let's pretend we're talking about one meter of wall. So we've got one meter of wall. Every one meter has 20 kilonewtons acting on it. So P is 20 kilonewtons. Um, where we have one meter, we have 20 kilonewtons per meter times one meter, or 20 kilonewtons. Area is B times L. Um, we could keep the B times L in this and say that 20 is times L. I often just make both of these one. Solves the same problem. Um, 50 kPa, if we want to know what it takes to have it just on the verge of failure, we can rearrange this and find that B needs to be 400 millimeters or 0.4 meters wide. We could make it bigger, but we can't make it smaller. So therefore B needs to be at least 400 millimeters wide. If we made it smaller, we would end up with a BF greater than 50 and then our soil would have a failure. So there are some kind of quick cheats for uh, thickness of a spread footing. Um, whatever your projection is here, so if we had said that that was a 400 or a 200 millimeter wall and we had our 400 footing, we would, or we would have um, 100 millimeters on each side, we could have a footing depth of 100. 
often we don't go less than 200 for our footing depth though. So you probably, um, that would probably start to fall out for that example. Stepped footing, we talked about earlier in the term. I'm just showing you a quick image of it. You have it in the typical details. Um, caisson or drilled piles. This is where we uh, actually drill down into the soil. We take soil out and pour in concrete. We would use this where our soil up here is really crappy or doesn't work very well. Um, or we might do it where we have really, really heavy loads. Um, because we get to use the bearing at the end, but we also get to use side friction. So sometimes we might need to go down very, very deep, um, and then we get that benefit of the side friction as well. So this is where we actually remove soil and put something back in its place. We can do belled caissons, which sounds fantastic, um, except you have to be able to remove the soil to cast your concrete there. I remember I had always known these existed, um, but I never saw anything practical about it because here in Ontario, we don't do this construction very often. Often we just go down and build a basement and we go down and we're down for frost um, because you need a machine to pour down and then flip out something and take out more soil below. You don't want to disturb this soil here. If you deserve disturb that soil, you have nothing for your caisson to be working against. Um, I did a project in Edmonton where the frost depth is nine feet. Um, so I was doing a project with no basement and heavy loads. And there what they do is they do grade beams um, with insulation below them um, to protect them from frost and they span the grade beams to caissons that are often belled caissons. We don't do caissons very often in Ontario, so there's not a lot of rigs that can do the belled caisson base. In Edmonton, every foundation contractor has a rig that can do belled caissons. So I was finally able to uh, do my belled caisson project. Piles. Piles is where we don't actually remove the soil, we drive something down into the ground. It's either a precast pile, uh, a steel element, it might be a pipe, or a timber pole. Um, people who live near um, construction that's happening with piles know that it is very loud and annoying because it is literally, you take a big heavy weight, drop it on it, and it moves down. Big heavy weight, drop it, and it moves down. Attach another element and keep going until you do that a series of times, until you get down as far as you need to go. You can usually measure that by knowing how much it's displacing. And when we get down to the proper displacement associated with the bearing capacity that's needed, you'll know that you have your foundation down deep enough. If we have something in bad soil that um, has load everywhere, like a slab, for example, um, or a slab on grade, we might need a series of piles with a pile cap. So this is a cluster of piles. This would be like a square with um, um, a grid of these piles sharing that load over the cap. Another option in crappy soil is engineered fill. So this is where they actually take away all the crappy soil and build the ground back up with good soil. So we go down to competent native soil, we add engineered fill that meets 150 KPA requirements so that we can put our foundations on it. And then our slab on grade only needs 24 KPA, so we keep lifting up with 24 KPA to support our slab on grade. I'll show you about that in just a minute. If we're just digging away locally, we'll trench out um, the area we need and build it up with um, engineered fill and then um, um, backfill with um, uh, uh, um, uh, compact material or, or elements that we've kind of made sure work pretty good. Helical piers. Helical piers are actually ones that we screw down into the ground. 
they're a proprietary system. Um, they can provide the base building engineer with some feedback about what they can expect for load resistance based on the geotechnical report. Uh, there is some risk here because they can't know what the actual capacity is until they start drilling in. Often they will overestimate and you might get a savings back and they will tell you how they distribute that. Um, the risk is that they start drilling and the soil is worse than they expected and they need to install more of these piers. Often though, once you're in the option of hel helical piers, it's almost because it's the only option you can do. There are a few other alternatives, um, but they work really well in fill sites. So I've done them a lot um, kind of on the Leslie Spit and down anywhere south of Front Street, which is all fake. Like that was all, for those that don't know, the bottom half of the city or the lower part of the city, anything south of Front Street that used to be pretty close to the water, everything south of that is built up with fill or kind of bad old materials that they took from building the subway um, and um, the basements of other construction projects. A map foundation is when we do a big foundation with columns coming down in different spots. So basically the upside down version of our pile cap with piers. Timber cribs, anyone who's uh, kind of seen a uh, cottage country knows that cribs are often what we do when we construct in water. We build, a, we build kind of a bottom layer, we put boards across and then we build it up and then literally you throw rocks in it until it's heavy enough that it sits there and won't move. Slab on grade. Um, uh, often we use it for interior applications. So just the basic slab on grade, we use it inside buildings as the kind of bottom surface of our building. So it gets poured directly on soil. Usually it's not just the native soil. We take away a little bit of the soil and put down clear crushed stone. Um, then it's on the native soil below that, assuming it has enough bearing capacity. The bearing capacity requirements for a slab on grade is 24 kPa. This fantastic exam question as well, which means fantastic assignment question. A slab on grade, typically has a bearing requirement of 24 kPa. Um, so frost voids and heaving, I just wanted to show you what frost heave can do. It's a really powerful element. Dave and I always say that you cannot design to resist the force of ice. Um, it is just so massive and so overwhelming. You cannot design to resist it. You can design to mitigate it, or avoid it. So when we go down four feet below grade, we're designing to avoid that frost heave force. So here are some of the ways we can do it. We can go down four feet. We can also do an insulated slab on grade. What we've done here is we've gone down some amount below grade and we've extended our soil out. And what we're doing is saying that that plus that, sorry, that plus that has to equal four feet. This can freeze, but right here can't because of this. The freezing can propagate, but it can only propagate four feet. So it has to come down and over here, which means it's hit its limit right about here, protecting this portion of the slab. If this is an exposed slab, so an exterior condition, all of it needs to be insulated underneath or else the frost will come down here, freeze here, and heave our slab up. If it's inside a basement, you probably don't need to do this. So here is that exact um, drawing. So this and this is a combination of four feet to meet that frost requirement. Or we can just go down four feet, but look, it's not from here, it's from here. No, actually this shouldn't, this one's not right. This is an airspace so that our frost actually can't propagate down through there. Ah, 
Oh, yeah, no, okay, so this should be the four feet, sorry. I'm tired. Uh, this is our four feet because this soil can freeze and propagate down, so we need this to be four feet from here. This is here to make sure that if this heaves, it doesn't damage our slab. So this is a framed slab. These are really important at the exits of buildings. Um, there are two reasons why it's important. Um, one is, well, it's, it's, a, it's a stepped um, problem, quite literally. What we used to do is just um, build this, or we would build this right on the soil, but we'd drop the top of the slab below the building. Um, and then if it heaved a little bit, no big deal. Um, but accessibility requirements, which are so important, means that somebody in a wheelchair needs to be able to get from this side to this side without a lip. So we have to build these flush. But if we just built it flush and this heaved, remember it's not a building, there's nothing precious on it, who cares if it heaves? But if it heaves and this is your exit door, you've trapped that door shut. You cannot open that door now. And it is a means of egress. It is your exit. Um, so that's a real life safety hazard. So we have to do this sequence of things with a frost slab. For whatever reason, on projects, I tend to find you get all the way to two days before tender and everybody realizes you have five frost slabs at your major exits around the building. So one of the first things I ask architects you know, probably in the mid construction document stage is where are your major exits that you need frost slabs for or, uh, you know, kind of um, accessibility entrances. All the other ones you can drop lower. So if there's a ramp right beside one door, you can probably drop that front frost slab below. Your ramp needs to be flush, but the other one doesn't. Retaining structures. Um, a retaining structure um, is braced against the top slab, or a supported wall one is braced against the top slab and braced against the foundation. So we have a wall that is spanning from top slab to bottom slab. We haven't done loads um, much, so we haven't done the calculations for this, so I'm not going to spend any time on that. Um, we will do a calculation for that next week or two weeks after. I can't remember what order uh, I left the lectures for this. We can, if we don't have something bracing the top, the soil wants to push this wall over. Um, we can do it by making sure our base is wide enough to resist it from tipping over because our element is heavy enough. We can do it so maybe that it's not heavy enough, but we spread our moment couple out some great distance. With this one, we actually, as we try to tip it over, the weight of our soil is actually helping keeping it down. So if you just need to draw something on a drawing, here are some good pr typical proportions of retaining walls. This is a good place to start on your drawing. Um, you can have timber retaining walls. Those need a dead man or a pile that goes backwards into the soil because what it's doing is as this is trying to tip over, it's engaging this soil here. We can do a modular block retaining wall, sometimes called armor stone, um, where the weight of this is helping prevent the overturning. Um, here's an example of a modular block retaining wall. A gabion wall, um, they're the ones that are the baskets that are filled with stone. Also uh, a gravity wall following the same, uh, the same ideas. One of the other things we can do is piles and lagging. So um, this one is really, uh, really helpful where we have a tight site. When we dig soil down, we have to leave we have to dig down at 7 to 10. So, where did my, where did my black thing go? Here we go. So, we have to dig down at 7 to 10. So, this. So, I'm just drawing 
an example here. So concrete wall. We can dig straight down in most soils four feet. We can dig straight down in most soils four feet. Um, but if we need to dig down further than that, we have to slope our ground at a seven to 10. If you dig too deep of a hole, that soil is gonna fall into your hole. So we dig back at a seven to 10 slope. So you can imagine if you're digging down three stories for a condo building in downtown Toronto with another building right beside you, you can't do that excavation. So what we do is shoring, which, which, which has piles and lagging. So you dig down four feet for your entire perimeter and you drive some piles down. Um, and then you slip pieces of wood in between those those elements. Um, where did that piece of paper go? So if I was drawing it in plan, I'm drawing at a crooked angle with my computer in the way. So these are really bad drawings. Um, we would uh, uh, often drive the piles down and slip um, a piece of wood down and we'd stack them up on top of each other um, so we're resisting four feet of soil with those pieces of wood that are spanning outward and then we dig four feet down again and those four feet would slide down and then we'll put four more feet drive the piles further add four more feet worth of um, uh, lagging and then we dig four more feet and we do that sequentially until you have a very steep pit if you've ever seen, if you've ever stood at the edge of one of those construction sites and you're looking at a deep pit and you're only like, uh, you know, a meter away from it, you've probably seen that shoring and lagging style construction. Okay, that's the end of the foundations lecture. We have one more, which is the lateral load resisting systems, which we've already talked about. So right now what I'm going to do is just show you a series of pictures. Some of them we've actually already seen in the other lectures. A reminder, lateral load resisting system required at every floor, every direction, every building. Two people got that question wrong on last week's assignment. I literally said in the question, by the way, the answer is every floor, every direction, every building, in the question. It was right there. It wasn't a trick question. I gave you the answer in the question. That is when we need a lateral load resisting system. We also need it in high seismic zones, but that's because it is a building that has a floor and a direction and is a building. So we've already met that criteria by saying it is any of those things. Here is our di diagonal tension compression brace. Again, we've already looked at all of these, so I'm just gonna show them again in case any new ones pop up. Our diagonal brace detail, diagonal brace detail. Um, this one's the tension only bracing, eccentric diagonal bracing, bracing with angles. I'm just gonna flip through. I don't think there's any new ones. I just wanted to kind of clump them together so that if you're stuck for something about a lateral load resisting system, you have some place you can go and just refresh yourself saying, oh yeah, those are all the lateral load resisting systems, kind of one, one concise spot. So we'll just go through these very quickly. I think these were all literally from the other three slides. Yeah, so here we're wood, nothing new in any of these. Bingo. All right, so driest, most boring lecture ever um, done. I'm just going to remind myself what, uh, aren't they the cutest? That was two years ago. They grow up so fast. So next week is sizing guidelines. Sizing guidelines is going to be really great. We just start to ease into the math. There will be math with it, um, but it's not complicated math. It's very, very basic linear math. But it takes all of these pictures we just did and says, how do we know what size things need to be? How do we even have an idea of what to draw on a set of drawings as the architect? 
And that's what next week's lecture is going to do us. You're going to come out of that being able to put on any set of preliminary documents a basic sizing assumption. It won't be the finalized assumption, the finalized member, but it will be pretty darn close to the final element. Okay, so uh, that sums up this week's lecture and I will uh, be in touch next week, guys.